Okay, let's go ahead and finish up these notes on uh, weak acid strong base titrations. Um, so again, just to kind of recap here, there are four basic stages to any titration. There's the beginning stage where you haven't added any of the uh, the base or the acid, depending on which direction you're titrating, but usually it's the base. Um, then you've got step two, which is between the beginning and the equivalence point, so you haven't gotten to the equivalence point yet. Step three is the equivalence point, and then step four is after the equivalence point. All right, so um, those are kind of the four stages of your titrations, and each stage is going to require a little bit different calculation. So um, we left off on stage two, talking about what to do between the initial pH and the equivalence point, and I think uh, it's going to be more obvious once I show you a uh, an actual example here. So we'll move on to stage three which is at the equivalence point, okay? So at the equivalence point, what you have to think about here, and there's an example which we're going to actually work out the, the calculation in a little while, but let's say you add 50 milliliters of 0.1 molar NaOH to 50 milliliters of 0.1 molar acetic acid. So um, you've got there the same amount of acid and base, so that's going to be uh, the equivalence point. All right. So what happens here? Um, now for a strong acid, strong base titration. Remember what happens is you got your H plus combines with the OH minus to make H2O. Okay. Um, and H2O obviously has a pH of seven. It's neutral. So um, the pH of that solution is going to be neutral because the only other things that you're going to have in there depending on what it is, let's say it's HCl and NaOH. Um, well, you'll have sodium ions, Na+, and chloride ions, Cl-. And those aren't going to do anything to the pH of a solution, which is the case anytime you have a strong acid, strong base reaction. Their salts are not going to uh, do anything to change the pH of the solution. So that's why it's always a pH of 7, if you titrate a strong acid with a strong base. Um, now with a weak acid, it's a little different because what we have here is we have OH- reacting with the acetic acid, HC2H3O2. Notice it's a forward arrow because we're dealing with a strong base here. When that reacts, you're going to end up with C2H3O2- minus plus H2O. Okay, so at the point when you've added enough OH- to react with all of the um, acetic acid, then the only thing you have left is the stuff on the product side, especially the C2H3O2-. Okay, now the thing about that is that's acetate, and that is a weak base, because as soon as you have that, the acetate, it's going to start reacting with the water in an equilibrium reaction to form uh, a little bit of acetic acid and a little bit of OH minus. Now it's not going to be a lot, but it'll be enough that the pH of that solution at the equivalence point is actually greater than 7. It's going to be more than 7 because we've got some OH- being created by the weak base over here. Okay, And so that's why um, in a weak acid strong base titration the pH is actually going to end up being higher than 7 um, instead of right at 7. Um, and then stage... Okay, well it even says that here for the equivalence point pH of a weak acid strong base titration will always be greater than 7 because the anion of the salt formed is a weak base. And then in stage 4, after the equivalence point, um, all the weak acid has been neutralized, so then you dump in more sodium hydroxide, more of the OH-, and that determines the pH of the solution. Okay, um, So, uh, over here, it's the C2H3O2- the acetate that determines the pH of the solution because it's the only base in the solution. 
But if you go a little bit further and you keep adding OH minus, this is a lot stronger base than C2H3O2 minus, than acetate. Um, so the OH minus is going to really be the determining factor as far as what the actual pH of the solution is. You can kind of ignore the effect from the uh, acetate because it's going to be negligible compared to the amount of OH minus you're dumping in. Okay, So it's actually, stage 4 is really easy with this kind of titration as well. Um, because all you have to do is figure out how much extra OH- minus did you dump in. And once you figure that out, um, then you just figure out the concentration of the OH-, minus, the pOH, and then you can use that to figure out the pH. Okay? So let's do a couple practice problems here. Um, and these, I believe, are in the book. Let's see. Yeah, okay. So... Um, this one, again, it's always good to identify with this type of problem. Where exactly are we in the calculation? Okay, uh, so on this one, it says calculate the pH of the solution formed in 45 milliliters of 0.1 molar in AOH is added um, to 50 milliliters of 0.1 molar acetic acid. So you can probably tell by looking at that, we haven't added quite enough of the sodium hydroxide for there to be equal moles of the acid and base. So there's a little bit more of the weak acid than there is of the base that we added. So what that means is we're not quite to the equivalence point yet. So this is, we're in stage two. Alright? So remember in stage two, just a reminder here, stoichiometry first, equilibrium second. Alright? So that's important. So what that means is we have to kind of think about the reaction that's going to occur here when we put the OH- minus into solution. Now we've already talked about this um, several times at this point, so I'll just write this down here. When this reaction happens, you're going to end up with C2H3O2- minus and H2O. Okay, so then we need to figure out how many moles of the OH- minus do we have and how many moles of the um, acetic acid do we have, okay? So what you have to do there is just remember your uh, molarity equals moles over liters equation, okay? And for the sodium hydroxide or just for the hydroxide, that's the part that we care about, um, we know volume and we know a molarity. So you multiply those two together and that's going to tell you the number of moles, okay? So once you do that, the moles of uh, OH- minus, it's going to be 4.5 times 10 to the negative third moles, okay? Now notice we're using moles instead of concentration because this is stoichiometry. So we're doing stoichiometry first. We're going to do our um, equilibrium second. Okay. So then we do the same thing for the uh, acetic acid, figure out how many moles of that we have, and it's actually 5.00 times 10 to the negative third. So, again, it's a little bit more. We kind of knew that. Um, we're going to assume when we start with this that there's zero of each of these. Uh, I mean, it's kind of weird to assume that for water. That doesn't really matter because it's not going to be an equilibrium expression anyway. So we can just worry about the acetate here. So what we've kind of done is we're starting to make a little bit of an ice table here. So then the change that happens, OH- minus is the limiting reactant here, so that's going to completely run out. Minus 4.5 times 10 to the negative third. Minus 4.5 times 10 to the negative third. And over here, it's going to be plus 4.5 times 10 to the negative third. Sorry, trying to make my time sign here. All right, so what that means is um, we are going to end up with 0.5 times 10 to the negative third of the acetic acid, which is the same thing as saying... Um, 5.0 times 10 to the negative second. Um, and we're going to end up with 4.5 times 10 to the negative third moles of the C2H3O2 minus. And then we're going to end up with uh, zero 
of the OH minus. Okay. Um, so again, here it's not really equilibrium. You could still call it an ice table if E maybe stands for end. Here, it's the end of the reaction. Um, you could also we could do just an ICF table like we did earlier in the year: initial, um, change, and final. Okay. So what that's going to do is that's going to give you a um, couple of things here. It gives you the number of moles of acetate you have left, uh, or the, sorry, the number of moles of acetic acid you have left, and it's going to give you the number of moles that you uh, made of the acetate. Okay. And once you know those two things, you can figure out the concentrations of the acetic acid and the acetate. Um, and you have to be a little careful here, okay, because this is moles. To find the concentration, you have to divide it by the liters. But we added 45 to 50, so, and I think we talked about this in the other set of video, or the other notes video. Um, you have to add those together, okay, so you're dividing both of these by 0 0.0950 liters. And that's going to give you your concentration for each of these. Okay, so the acetic acid concentration is going to be 0 0.0053 molar, and the concentration for the acetate is going to be 0 0.0474 molar. Okay, so now we know our two concentrations, and it kind of makes sense that there would be more of the acetate than there is the acetic acid, because we've added almost enough OH- at this point to convert it all. Um, so that, that should make sense to us. Um, so that's, we just did the stoichiometry, okay, and all we did there was we figured out how much of the acetic acid do we have left, and how much of it got converted into acetate. So now what we can do is equilibrium. So equilibrium second. And I think the easiest way to do this is to use the Henderson-Hasselbeck equation. So um, we're trying to find the pH. We know the pKa because the Ka is 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. Take the negative log of that. It's going to be 4. Point, sorry, that's a bad 4. 4.74 um, plus the log of concentration of base which is 0 0.0474 oops what did I do? divided by the concentration of the acid which is um, 0 0.0053 So then once you solve that, whoops, did I get those backwards? Oh no. Should be base over acid, I think. Oh, okay, I'm I'm sorry. The solution in the book they don't use Henderson Hasselbeck, but I, I really think that that's the one that you should use. I think it's easier. Um, so once you solve this through, what you should end up getting here, because this number is going to be uh, the logarithm number is going to be significantly greater than one. Um, so you're going to end up with a uh, a log term that's. Uh, bigger, it's not a negative number, so you're going to actually add that to the 4.74 and what you're going to end up with here for your pH should be 5.70 after you solve the Henderson-Hasselbeck equation here. Okay, and um, that should make sense because acetic acid by itself can have a lower pH than that. It's still in the sort of in the acid range uh, but it's getting a little bit higher because we've added a lot of hydroxide. So um, it's always good to kind of stop and make sure your answers make sense. Okay, now what if we've got uh, the 
equivalence point. So we're right at the equivalence point. So the way that this would work, and this is like sample exercise 17.8 in the book, um, but the way that this would work is you basically know at this point, you know that you started with, um, I think we actually did the calculation over here. You started with, uh, let's see, 5 times 10 to the negative third right here, moles of the uh, acetic acid, okay? Now at the equivalence point, all of that acid has been converted into its conjugate base, all right? So I mean, if you want to think about this in terms of what we just set up, instead of the 4.5 times 10 to the negative 3, you have 5.00 times 10 to the negative 3 for the OH minus. Um, which would mean that they would both be present in equal amounts, which means that they would both get completely used up. So you'd have zero on the reactant side, and it would all change to 5.0 times 10 to the negative third moles on the, um, on the product side, okay, so the weak base. So basically what you're going to end up with here is um, a concentration, well, no, sorry, number of moles of C2H3O2 minus is going to be equal to that 5.0 times 10 to the negative third. All right, so there's a number of moles of the acetate. Um, now what you really want here is a concentration. Um, so we need to divide that by the uh, number of liters in the solution, which um, whoops, I left something out there. It should have been uh, titrating 50 milliliters of 0.1 molar acetic acid with um, oh well, okay, actually I guess I didn't leave anything out. It says at the equivalence point. So at the equivalence point um, we would have added 50 milliliters of the sodium hydroxide to get to the equivalence point. They just don't tell you that. Um, so, I forget what the point was that I was making there. Oh, the point is, um, the total volume here, once we've added both of these together to get to the equivalence point, we'd have to add 50 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. So we're going to end up with a total volume of 100 milliliters, or 0 0.100 liters. Okay? So then you take the 5 times 10 to the negative third divided by 0.1, you end up with 5 times 10 to the negative second. Okay, that's your concentration for the acetate ion. Now here's the thing about acetate ion. It's a weak base. So as soon as you have that, uh, wait, sorry, plus H2O, it's going to start uh, reacting with water to raise the pH of the solution. With, with this reaction right here, okay? So then again, you can do another ice table. Um, on this one, you actually have to. You can't use Henderson-Hasselbeck when you have none of one of the species in the buffer solution because then you'd have a, a zero, and that makes things difficult to solve. Um, so, we've got, uh, we said 5.00 times 10 to the negative second is the concentration there. Um, and so then we basically just have to think about, okay, we're going to assume we have none of this and none of this because they both just reacted um, a little bit earlier, and they're completely gone now. So we have none of those, okay, so then the change step. Um, well, we don't know because this is an equilibrium reaction, so we need to know the Ka for this, um, which I think it gave us. Yeah, there we go. Ka equals 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. So um, what we're going to do here is we're going to say, okay, this is going to go down by minus x. Oops. This is going to go down by plus, or go up by plus x. This is going to go up by plus x. So then you've got your typical ice table where you end up uh, making the simplifying assumption with the minus x
and then you get your equilibrium concentrations here and then you just basically set this up like a normal uh, you know solving for the pH of a basic wheat base solution um, so you're going to end up with 5 times 10 to the negative second is equal to x squared over 0.1 because 0.1 is um, wait uh, wait a second um, sorry I said that wrong you're going to you're going to end up with 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth is equal to x squared over 5.0 times 10 to the negative second. Okay? Um, and that's going to be your basic setup on that one. And then once you work that out, you should find um, that the pH of that one is going to be 8.72. Okay? And again, that makes sense because... We said that when you titrate a weak base with a strong acid, or sorry, weak acid with a strong base, um, at the equivalence point, the pH is going to be higher than seven, and that's all because of the C2H3O2 over here, because it starts doing equilibrium as a weak base right after, um, right after the reaction happens. Okay, a couple of things here just to sum up. Um, pH curves, titration curves, how they differ for weak acid, strong base titrations, as opposed to strong acid, strong base titrations. Um, so you've got a solution of, uh, let's see, sorry, my phone's ringing. You can probably hear that in the background. Um, solution of weak acid is going to have a higher initial pH. That's pretty obvious because it's weaker. And we've already talked about most of these, I think. Um, and it's going to be above 7. So then here's, when you're looking at it, the Ka's, the higher they get, the higher the pH starts at, and the less drastic your, um, your equivalence point curve will be. Um, so it's more important to choose a good indicator. And then, obviously, if you do it in the opposite direction, a weak base with a strong acid, it's going to yield the opposite results. Uh, so it would look like this. Um, and then you also have polyprotics, that, and you, you probably need to read about those in the book a little bit. But if you graph a polyprotic, you're actually going to end up with uh, different equivalence points to, for each of the hydrogens that comes off. So hopefully that's kind of obvious. So you should be able to look at one of these things and to some extent kind of tell how many hydrogens they have. Now this this last equivalence point here would be almost impossible to see with uh, H3PO4 because it almost just doesn't really even happen. Um, so, th But the first two you can see pretty clearly, the equivalence points, because that's the steep slope. Um, okay, so that was another long one, but I think that's it. Um, and I guess we'll see you guys in class.